of the albums was that the band um, didn't come from Earth, you know. So I guess we played that part to some degree. That seemed to communicate. You know, I mean, we used to get fan mail, lots of fan mail, you know, where people actually did believe that. I said, no, Yorkshire, honest. Oh, from Yorkshire? Well, of course, they'll be fantastic. The glam period, the rock, the zaniness, the theatrics, that period of Ziggy Stardust to me is what David Bowie will long be remembered for. I mean, it was completely different to what anybody else was doing, you know. I mean, uh, how we came up with the stuff, I don't know. <laughs> Where he got it from. We'd just come off stage and we had like jeans and t-shirts on, just chilling out. And three guys booled up and they had roller skates on, dresses, beards, full makeup, earrings, the work. And they just stood in front of Mick, Trevor and I. And one guy just went, gee man, you're really weird. <laughs> People get up to some shit. He did begin to suffer from delusions of grandeur, probably. It seemed within six months they played Carnegie Hall. We created in, into this image and uh, he lived it on stage as well. He became Ziggy Stardust. Uh, of all the shows on this tour, this, this particular show will remain with us the longest because... <laughs> Not only is it, not only is it the last show of the tour, but it's the last show that we'll ever do. Thank you. We'd been together for about, oh, about six months as a band uh, called Rono. Bowie rang up and asked if we'd come down and do a John Peel show, radio broadcast. So they said, yeah, well, they'd come down and do it. And I was told that I wouldn't be playing bass. It'd be Abby Flowers playing bass. So I went down with them anyway, just for the ride, you know, just to go down there. And uh, I got gets down there and uh, there's Bowie there and there's all these other people there and all the gear set up in Bowie's front room to re and stuff. There's Danny Gillespie and some of his mates and that. And then all of a sudden he turns around and he says, well, you're playing bass now because Abby can't make it. And I said, well, how many songs have I got to learn then? So he says, 12. <laughs> Which was which was actually most of Unky Dory. Oh You Pretty Things is one of those songs that you look back at now and you realise, of course, it was very ambivalent, very bisexual, even homosexual in the way that it worked. And the era it came out in, of course, people were opening up their whole horizon to accepting anything. Sexual experimentation was regarded as part of the era. People talk about the permissiveness of the 60s, but it was a very straight-laced permissiveness to some extent, at least as far as the public was concerned. When Barry declared his 
homosexuality. That was early in 1972. And uh, it created quite an uproar, really. It was not a bad thing for him in this country, although it certainly wasn't the norm. No one had ever really heard that from a you know, a rock star before. Yeah, no, and I don't think England was shocked. It was just everyone was shocked because no one was talking about it. So you would go to the Sombrero where, you know, it wasn't even a gay club, but it was, there were lots of gay people there. You go across the street to the gates. There was plenty of all of this excitement going on, you know, in our cities where, where it was a little hipper, but um, no one talked about it. I can remember this, uh, this uproar uh, in the UK when he did make this declaration of homosexuality as a teenager buying Melody Maker every week, and I'm pretty sure it was in Melody Maker that this was first announced. And uh, yeah, and even the little girls were just thrilled with this because on the one hand there was perhaps Mark Bolan who was very pretty and glittery and uh, great pop rock singles, but David Bowie was something more alluring. Oh, Hunky Dory is such an odd album because it's out of time and out of sync. If you actually look at the early Bowie albums, by the time he got to the man who sold the world, he'd really gone into his stride with a heavy sound. And then he took a complete directional change with Hunky Dory, which in a way should have come before the man who sold the world, because the man who sold the world led on to Ziggy Stardust. Hunky Dory has such a diversity of style, it's got the musical element in there, it's got the acoustic element in there as well as the heavy stuff. And yet, although the man who sold the world established Bowie as a credible artist, as a performer, whereas everything before was a little bit odd, eccentric and almost gimmicky, Hunky Dory was the album that most Bowie fans would now look back at and say, well, that was when we really started to identify with what he was doing. And that's when the chameleon aspect started to come through because it did have such a diversity and it was all locked together by Bowie's own personality and force of talent. It's debatable as to if Hunky Dory was the start of his career. Of course, it had space oddity. This is me. I think a lot of people began to think of him as being a one-hit wonder because uh, there was very little happened after that. He had The Man Who Sold the World, which was a big hit for Lulu. His album of the same was uh, uh, the same name was Very Rocky, um, which maybe a lot of people didn't take to. But I guess by the time Hunky Dory came along, that was the album that um, that set him up. It put him on a roll, and I think that was the one that people genuinely th think of as being the, f the start of his career. I met him before we went down to London. I went to see him do a show in Harrogate and um, he just quite looked quite normal then, you know, I mean, just long blonde hair and tight black leather pants and, and a shirt on. He didn't look any different to any other sort of folky looking person or anything, you know, and he didn't really have any real impression, I just thought, oh, this guy's are playing acoustic guitar, and that was about it, really, you know. Um, and that was my first impressions of him. But then when we got down to London and started working with him, then you realise that this is, this guy's a bit different, you know. Um, he's a bit odd. <laughs> working with David was different. Um, it was, you know, sometimes a matter of keeping up with where he was going. And, uh, I mean, he, he, he had a knack of not knowing anything about studios, which he doesn't, he didn't. I don't know if he does now. And he'd see a, an accordion or a trumpet or a, some instrument that the band who'd just been recording had left behind. And, uh, we'd be saying, this track needs something else. And he'd go, oh, I know what, let's use the accordion. And we would be going, oh, you're joking, that won't work, that doesn't fit. 
and he would do it and mess about with it and it would work and like nobody could see it nobody could see obviously what he could see to do with it which was quite odd because sometimes you were convinced it was a waste of time we went to the pub together, we went to restaurants together, we, we did everything. You know, when we first started gigging, before we, we did, uh, even before the concept of Ziggy had come up, we were out doing uh, some pub gigs and stuff, and Bowie had an old Rover, and we'd sling all our gear in the back of the Rover, and we'd all get in the car, and he'd drive off to the gig, and we'd play the gig, and then we'd all drive back to Adden Hall. So it was like a band thing, you know, it was, ex it was a band. Except that he was David Bowie, you know, and we, we were the band with him, behind him, you know. So it was all done together. It was all we did everything, every, everywhere we went was together and, and stuff. I think he liked that because he'd been on his own for so long as a, just a solo artist doing acoustic stuff. That to have the band around him all the time, he could bounce off us, you know, which was great for him, and it was and it was great for us. The thing about it was is that the first show or the second show was just so boring and it really was just as boring as it could be and the songs were great so I, I caught after the show I I said to them I said you know guys I said I think it would be totally cool you know it really would be cool if we um tried to get a little more theatrical I mean you know David yeah I mean, you worked with Lindsay Camp, you danced with Hermione, you have a good theatrical, and I, you know, and I was making it sound like it was all my fault, so David could stay butch. This was dumb Angie. Dumb Angie wants the show to look nice. They've got to get all dressed up and have lights, because dumb Angie is bored with a bunch of musicians. Right? Works. Good cop, bad cop. David was, you know, well, I don't know, Angie. That's an idea, though, you know, looking at the boys from Yorkshire and the boys are looking at me and I'm going, listen, guys, it'll be cool. It'll really be cool. You don't have to wear anything you don't want to. You don't have to dress up any way you don't want to. You have to choose how you want to look. If you don't make the choice, I'll make it for you. She was the, like the fifth member of the band, I would say. Um, she was there for everything. Um, she was... She had so much energy, it was just unbelievable. I mean, this was a woman who organised everything. Um, she organised all the stage clothes, she organised the making of things, she organised Bowie, getting us from A to B. Um, she was like a full-on tour manager in a way, you know. I mean, she, she really did get involved. She, she was a lot to do with it. I said to Rono, I said, how about... Uh he always looked beautiful, you know, his shirts, his mom just kept him immaculate. His shirts were starched and perfect, and I, know, I knew that's how he liked to look. And I said, well, Rhonda, how about a suit? You know, some kind of... Well, well, I don't want to look ridiculous when everyone else is wearing costumes. I said, well, how about a gold lame suit? Oh, I don't know about that, Angie. That's, I mean, that's Elvis, isn't it? I'm... I said, come with me to the shop. I've seen one, it's, it's gold, but it's not Lame. It was like tiny, tiny, thin corduroy, but gold, I mean, shiny gold. Rono loved it. Ooh, I look fabulous in this. Hey, no, no. Hey, no, no. Didn't know what time it was when the lights were low. I leaned back on my radio Some cat was laying down some Get it on rock and roll, he said Then the loud sound, it seemed to fade It came back like a slow voice On a wave of thighs That was no DJ, that was Hazy hey, Cosmic Jive The relationship between Bowie and Mick Ronson on stage was... Um, very interesting because it was quite the opposite to the normal macho relationship between band members on stage. Uh, there was something pretty, um, pretty alluring about the way that they were with each other. Um, I remember when they did Starman on top of the Pops in 72 and David Bowie put his arm on Mick Ronson. He did it in such a way that a whole generation of teenagers were just gobsmacked. And then of course later that year when uh, in Suffragette City for the first time, 
Bowie um, simulated fellatio on Mick Ronson's guitar. There was massive hysteria about that. that. That was just something that had never been seen before. That was fantastic. You know, this was taking uh, stagecraft to the next level, really. Poor Rono, his mother. <laughs> She, she said to me about, she said, well, I'm so glad you called and warned me about the photograph in Melody Baker. Because I talk, called her and I said, oh, it was a big setup shot. I didn't want her to worry, you know, I didn't want her to have a fit, you know, just because we were taking liberties with her handsome son, making it, you know, look great on stage. And I didn't want her to think it was, you know, something she shouldn't be aware of, she couldn't be proud of. I said, nah, just say to them, look at that. There's a star man waiting in the sky. He's over the sky, took it away. She knows it's all worth while it's over. And the children you said, let the children. Yeah, Mick as a guitarist was, um, he was a tasty player. He, uh, he, he just had a knack of playing really simple but tasty that really communicated, but you knew it was a good player playing it. Um, just little twists of the notes. Surely he really knew his stuff. Mick Ronson's contribution was, was absolutely crucial to City Stardust. Um, although Bowie himself is not always gracious enough to give credit where it's due, in fact, in one particularly grand moment, Bowie said, um, oh, it's, it's all my baby. I just had to hum the guitar solos to Mick and he had to play them. Although that's not the way Ken Scott, the producer of the album, remembers things. Um, Mick Ronson and David Bowie co-arranged the whole album. Mick Ronson also played keyboards in the album. But according to Ken Scott, um, Mick Ronson's greatest contribution was that intuitively he knew what it was that David Bowie was getting at and what he wanted. In my opinion, Mick Ronson, his contribution arrangement-wise to the early albums was absolutely inestimable. Um, being the guitarist in the band, he had a great sense of economy. When, the, when he could let loose with the orchestra, when to hold it back. He often featured quite small string sections, which was um, quite a unique character where at that time when people were after huge string sections, uh, the sound was absolute, actually quite small. He could be majestic, as on Life on Mars. He could be very simple, as on Starman, which is almost corny, in, uh, some might say. Um, so there, his, his orchestral writing was definitely underrated. Uh, his rhythm arrangements were great. He had a great sense of dynamics. Mick Ronson is a fan was a fantastic guitarist. He wasn't just a trash rock guitarist, which he was known for because he inspired so many trash rock musicians over the years. He was very delicate when he needed to be, very fluent, very fluid. He made the guitar speak. and. Again, although he's always praised and hailed, I think a lot of what he did is lost because he's known for one particular style and, of course, he went on to work with Ian Hunter as well. Would, uh, I've always felt if Mick Ronson was allowed to in a studio, sadly it'll never happen now, was allowed to run free and actually bring out all the elements that made him such a, a talent, he would come out with an album that would surprise a lot of people. Only that could have happened at some point. But... He's always known as being the trash rock god, and that's not a bad thing to be, actually, when you look at the musicians he's inspired over the years, from Hanoi Rocks to Guns N' Roses. Well, the lovely Trevor Boulder, him of the long sideboards that go down nearly as long as his legs, um, I don't think you can possibly overestimate how important he was to the early albums of Bowie. Um, before, long before I knew the man, his, his bass playing had made a great impact on me. You listen to songs like John, I'm Only Dancing. To me, the hook is the bass part in the chorus. Um, five Years, fantastic bass playing. Moon Age Daydream, absolutely a tremendous bass player, a great riff player. Um, the playing on the, the, the song Ziggy Stardust is absolutely fantastic. 
Um, uh, he had character and humour. He was a melodic bass player, and I would place him um, equally alongside Andy Fraser as the two great British melodic rock bass players of all time. The sideburns were complete. His Trevor Boulder sideburns were ludicrous. <laughs> frankly ridiculous, but he's never been the man of great image. It has to be said, he never had glamour. <laughs> he comes from Hull, what can you say? We had the opening night, I think it was in Tokyo, and uh, Trevor had long hair then, so we got a hairdresser to come in and do him a, a samurai hairdo, and he had the big bamboo sticks or whatever sticking out, Japanese makeup, Japanese costume, and we all was something a little bit Japanese. He looked unbelievable. I mean, forget about Japan. You know, Japan thought that they really invented all that. Mm -mm. Trevor, he got to Japan. The Japanese were crazy about him. He's the only one that looked like them. No, the rest were blonde. You know what I mean? Trevor looked like he was Japanese. The fans went crazy. And he dug it. Them. A soldier with a broken arm to stare to the wheels of a Cadillac. Five Years was a song that I kind of requested that they write. I, I knew we needed something rousing, a big anthem at the end. The audience looked like they wanted to come, you know, and there was no way to do it. I thought if they could just sing, chorus or something. So when they wrote Five Years, I felt that they'd actually got a show now that was musically an entity. Well, Five Years starts with a drum intro. And that was really just setting the mood for the piece, really. Getting that hopelessness into a drum beat um, that was interesting at the same time as uh, everything's hopeless and we're all going to die, I guess. <laughs> Sounds very deep, what you can actually do with a drum kit, but you can do it. Um, and then the idea was to, was to stay on that. That was like the, for me, that was the, no matter what, what where the arrangement goes, um, which it does get quite embellished on the way through and more desperate. The drum beat still has that um, apathetic hopelessness about it all the way through. Um, and it was good, good actually playing that. It was like being the stable point through all this mayhem. Five years, a very interesting song. I think the general consensus is that it was Bowie was writing about an imaginary end of the world um, and quite a disturbing lyric. Um, the, the idea about a person sitting in an ice cream parlour oblivious to what's going to be going on. Musically, it's a very interesting track. Because the track fades in, it leaves the listener thinking that it's an awkward time signature, but it actually isn't. It's a straight 6-8, but just at the point that the track fades in, you're caught on the wrong foot, so you tend to think that maybe it's a, a more complicated time signature than it really is. Five Years is one of those songs that's very down and downbeat. It was one of those Ziggy moments where he looks at life and says, unless we do something, we're dead. Things are not going to improve on the planet, and although you can say the five-year plan didn't quite work. I think it's a way a lot of people still look at life in terms of we haven't got very long and we have to get our act together and do something. And it's something from the outside that has to influence and inspire us. What Bowie did in that song, it was an epic for a start. And the way that he built it was to keep you on tenterhook. So when you actually felt like you were into the song, he'd take you in a different direction. He would actually build it and make it unsatisfactory and uneasy in many respects. It's easy listening that's difficult to actually hear. And that's the weird thing about the way Bowie built the song. He established a mood and then changed it, but by changing the mood, he kept you in that mood because you can get comfortable in the groove and in the zone even when something is dow beat and dark. He kept it dark by constantly changing. And he ne I never feel he actually resolves it because he doesn't want to. At the end of the song, he wants to make you feel I feel uncomfortable about this. It's because it's musically a little uncomfortable. And then you realize actually the music reflects the mood of the lyrics. And it was a sensible and clever piece of orchestration. We got five years stuck on my eyes. Five years. What a surprise. Five years. A brain hurts a lot.
Woody, like Trevor, is one of the great underrated British rock musicians. A great drummer who could cope quite easily with all the intricate time signature and tempo changes that uh, strongly featured in all of Bowie's material. Um, and yet he could be so simple. You'd listen to him and you would think, well, this is not a jazz player along the lines of a Bill Bruford or something. Yet he was quite capable of handling any of that style of music. Um, and he made some great performances. Five years was a fantastic accomplishment for him. Uh, Life on Mars, again, was absolutely great. He could be absolutely rock solid um, and he would swing like the best of them. Woody Woosmansey is one of the greatest drummers of all time. I've never understood why he's never got the credit, but that may well be because he was with Bowie in The Spiders from Mars and he was seen as a sideman. He went on to do Woody Woodman's U-Boat, which is a really good band in its own right. But somehow he's always got locked into The Spiders from Mars era, and I'm sure he's still working these days as a session musician and doing very well for himself. He deserves more credit than he gets, and I've always felt it's a little unfair that people don't realise his dexterity, his power, his drive actually played such an important part in the whole Spiders of Mars sound. Because you listen to the drum sound in those early days, and it was far more focused and far heavier than a lot of other bands were doing. He's not quite John Bonham, but he's probably a lot more powerful than other drummers who were being raved about as the heaviest drummers around and the best drummers around. So thoroughly underrated is the best way to thumb, sum him up. Bowie always intended for Ziggy Stardust to be something more than just the routine album. Um, he saw it in pretty grand terms and he wanted it to be, he, he actually wanted to write some sort of musical or opera, but he kind of uh, lessened his ambition to the degree that he wanted to do something which would bring in theatre and mime and um, cinema, all those kind of very dramatic qualities, clothes, everything, all sorts of visual and theatrical aspects all woven into the one thing which he did succeed in doing. It's theatre, isn't it? It was a theatre thing, you know. We, he always classed it as theatre. We were theatre, not just straightforward rock and roll. It was all theatre. It was the story of Ziggy on stage, you know. It was like you go to the West End and see it, I suppose, you know. Ziggy Stardust is one of those strange records that to this day remains an enigma. It's because it's based on the idea of an alien rock and roll star, which Bowie had become by that point. He became the character of Ziggy, who comes down to earth and realises what's wrong and observes from a distance. But it remains an enigma because the album grew away from that concept. It was bigger than the concept. And Bowie actually at that point with the Spiders from Mars did have a very quintessential sound that was very rock and roll, but took in every other influence he'd always aspired towards. Whereas Hunky Dory compartmentalized, if you want, Bowie took everything and put it into the melting pot and came out with a Ziggy sound, which at that point defined what Bowie was all about. And I think to a lot of people still defines what Bowie is all about. Bowie was definitely one of the first people to see the potential of such a grand idea. He wasn't the first person to do it. The Who were probably there with Tommy. Sergeant Pepper was a bit of a concept. At least it started as a concept, it didn't necessarily end up as one. But Sergeant Pepper had the idea of the band within the band. The Who with Tommy had the concept of the Messiah walking amongst the people. Um, both things which feature on Ziggy Stardust. But Bowie was the first person to, to do it in such a polished and colourful and vigorous manner and in such a concise way too. It is heavy metal, it is punk, it is glam, it's got all those things in there, but ultimately it's Bowie. It's the sound of Bowie. And to this day, that's the way to describe it because it grew apart and away from its influences and took on a life of its own. Tony DeFries was very interesting because he uh, allegedly decided that Bowie should live like a star before he was actually one. And so people were hired to enable Bowie to live a life of celebrity that he hadn't actually earned yet. Um, it gave the illusion that he was a massive rock star before he actually was, and people believed it. So it was a kind of, it was a case of art manipulating life in a way. We toured America on the first tour for three months. 
and in that three months, I think we did 10 concerts. One in New York, one in Boston, one in Detroit, one in Miami, San Francisco, Phoenix, and LA. And we'd do a gig and have two weeks off and stay in the best hotels. I mean, the best hotels with suites, fly first class everywhere, limousines everywhere. And he hadn't sold a record. How could he have been so important when they didn't sell any records? Because Tony DeFries talked RCA out of the tour support that helped keep them going long enough for the record sales to catch up. So it wasn't that they weren't good or anything like that or that they couldn't sell records. It's because the, the audience had to catch up and grow up and understand what was going on. And there was about a two year lag before they started selling. But to give RCA credit and Tony DeFries, he kept RCA interested in paying and RCA kept paying and they were very kind. I was the person who was able to get the Pennebaker film funded by turning around and going to the research department of RCA at Select Division and asking them for the money because we'd gone up there to play for the factory workers to be cool. And I thought of that too, because I'm not an idiot, I'm a marketer. So they owed us one and they were so kind, they turned around and went, sure, we'll pay for the Pennebaker film. So when Tony DeFries couldn't get another dime out of RCA, I was able to get the money for the Pennebaker film to be made. Baker really captured glam rock at its best, at its peak, and he was lucky enough to capture it on a really historic evening. The, the production by that time had become really spectacular. Barry with his red hair, his makeup, his costumes, it, it was a sensational enough performance without what actually happened that night. The Ziggy motion picture, um, it's one that I watch from time to time with my son, we're both fans of this. It's, you have to remember that it's 31 years old and so the lighting is a bit poor. I don't think the band get enough shots in it. I think there is one wonderful uh, section uh, uh, where you can see Trevor. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, there wasn't a huge amount of re-patching or re-recording after the event. I think it's a really important film. I think technically it's not wonderful. I think the 5.1 mix that my old friend Tony Visconti has done is very, very good indeed. Um, but if, if you're a Bowie fan, how can you not have that film? Ziggy Stardust motion picture is very patchy. It's not particularly good. It really shouldn't have been made because it didn't live up to where Ziggy Stardust should have been. And I think part of the problem is that what you needed was a great epic performance. The man who fell to earth was really Ziggy Stardust the motion picture. That should have been renamed Ziggy Stardust the motion picture. But the actual movie itself, it's a little disappointing, it's a little flat. It doesn't quite capture the grandeur of the vision, the topicality of what De Bowie was talking about, and more importantly, the urgency of the whole thing that surrounded him. And I think it really let down the whole image. I think, I think it's really important and it is just great. I think the, the inclusion of little things like the audience and the police outside of Hammersmith Odeon, it's just great, it takes you back in time. I think it's, I think it's something that every Bowie fan has to own. Yeah, Suffragette said he just kicked the boat. Thank you.
Suffragette City, what a great simple track. It's, it's, it's like the best of the Stones and T-Rex all rolled into one. Another open tribute to Velvet Underground, who obviously influenced Bowie a lot. Uh, it's a swaggering rock track in the key of A, the big open A chords, which are a rock guitarist's delight. It's like it, it starts and it doesn't let up, and you, you're in a rock and roll city, you're in a rock and roll lifestyle, and, um, and that was the intention of it. This is rock and roll, and um, get on board or swing your hook. <laughs> Especially live, it just went down so well every night. Um, people couldn't sit down. Suffragette City is a driving song. It's one of those songs, as soon as you hear the intro, you know it's going to really take you and get your head banging if you want, get your feet tapping, get you driving along. It's a motorway song in a way, you can actually put it in and you can hear it going down the motorway. And it's a great rhythmic rock and roll song, a heavy rock song if you want. And it's so great to hear that at any particular point because even though the production is very sparse and dated now according to our uh, designs and desires, it still has that rhythm, it still has that movement in it. And it, it's about the secret of rock and roll. What's great rock and roll? Movement. And it's got movement in there and it gets you moving. At the end of it you think, yeah, you know what, I feel better for a good quick headbang as, as it were. Oh, ram, bam, thank you, man. Everybody, this has been the one of the greatest tours of our life. We really, uh, of all the shows on this tour, this this particular show will remain with us the longest because not only is it not only is it the last show of the tour. But it's the last show that we'll ever do. I mean, one minute we were doing the show and everything was going fine, you know? And the next he was retiring and the band was fired. We were treated very badly. Uh, I mean, even Angie Bowie quotes in her book that um, me and Woody never got any of the money that we'd, we were supposed to get and that we deserved. We were, we were left without anything, you know? I mean, uh, I blame a lot of that in a lot of respects on the management. You know, we, we were promised, because we, the, the whole thing had grown up at Adden Hall, the whole thing had started at Adden Hall, and we'd all been involved together. Okay, David was the artist, but the whole thing had grown together. We'd, the band and him had made that into what it was. And so we were promised a percentage of what was in. And David always, would always say, oh, we're all going to be really rich, you know, after this, because we'd started to make it. So we're all going to be really rich. Don't you worry, we'll all be fine. And of course, when it came down to the, the breakup of it all, it was, he was gone, he couldn't, you couldn't find him anywhere. And of course, Tony DeVries would say, well, I never promised you anything. So you finished up penniless. Uh, and they finished up earning, well, DeVries finished up earning lots of money off it. And they weren't interested. I think that, that the one thing that really hurt was, you know, they, they just weren't interested in your welfare. After all you'd done, and because we did play a big part in that, and after all we'd done, and after we'd built up that we were all going to be really looked after, and we'd, you know, we all had families and kids, and we'd get a house and car, and, you know, we could look after our children and, and all that, and then at the end of it, you, you, you finish up on the dole. <laughs> you know, which is crazy. David Bowie turning into Ziggy Stardust was was really quite a gradual thing. I don't think it happened overnight, but um, his growing success fed his growing ego, and uh, he did begin to suffer from delusions of grandeur, probably. The drugs were what caused him to be unbearable to work with. He wasn't god-awful when I met him. He really wasn't. He was charming. The drugs in America caused him to be first incommunicable. He, he couldn't speak. He couldn't put two words together. Throw him on a stage, he was fine. He could do the whole show. I'd come off and he'd be a blithering idiot. But like Marianne Faithful, throw him on a stage and he was fine. 
But that's not enough. I'm sorry. I wasn't in awe of what he did on stage. I've, I've seen better people on stage. What I was interested in was whether we were delivering quality material. I, I know it sounds camp, but I'm serious. I'm really that old fashioned. I just wanted to know that it was a great show and the music was as great as it could be and you could hear it and they looked good and it was exciting. Well, I accomplished that. I couldn't accomplish anymore. After that, he wouldn't talk to me. After that, I was persona non grata. All he wanted to do was to get rid of me. It just happened gradually. The bigger he got, the more fame he got. Was what he always wanted to be famous and the more and more he got of it, you know, it's an animal, isn't it? Fame takes you over. You know, I, I just think it took him over, like a lot of artists it does, and they, they think that there's somebody bigger than everybody else, and they're better and whatever, and really they're not, you know. And it it engulfed him, did stardom. It, uh, it turned him into a different person that I'd met in the, in the beginning. You know, I mean, I think he's like, he's back to how he was before, you know. Now, or has been for many years, most likely, but... Um, to go from being sort of known to being a huge star, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's hard work, is that? It must be tough. I mean, generally it was, I guess it was fun as well, above everything. You did your job, you did, you did what was wanted live and everything else, and you had a good time. Um, it's like that thing of the happy times are getting there, not necessarily when you get there. You know, when you look back, you um, you realise that they were the good times, and you didn't sort of notice the really good times because you were going through them, thinking the good time was at the other end. But you get there and look back, and you go, "No, that was a good time." You know, and even sleeping in a sleeping bag on his landing in his flat, which is where we probably slept for about a year. The whole band were in sleeping bags, you know, doing the first albums and that. And at the time, you think it's rough. You look back and you think, no, nah, it was actually cool. We got up, um, had a coffee, went down and played drums straight away and, and jammed. And then had breakfast and, you know, um, it was good. It was a good scene, you know. Time it was and the lights were low. I leaned back on my radio. Some cat it was it was brilliant, you know. I mean, it was everything I wanted to be. From being 14 years old, from seeing the Beatles, I wanted to be up on the stage and being a big band. I wanted to be on top of the pops, and I did all that. And I travelled the world and I played all the big places, and you know. I did everything. There's a star waiting in the sky. He likes to come and meet us, but he thinks he's through our minds. And there's a star. Seventy-one, seventy-four is often regarded as his golden era. Certainly, um, it's my favourite era of Bowie. Um, but there were some other great periods in his musical life. If you take 76 to 82, the Thin White Duke and the Berlin period, there was some great stuff came out there. The Young Americans, there was some great stuff. Uh, and there's been great singles down the years. China Girl, Golden Years, Fame. Sound and Vision, these are all great tracks, but if one talks about a consistent period, then I think few would argue that 71 to 74, the glam period, the rock, the zaniness, the theatrics, that period of Ziggy Stardust to me is what David Bowie will long be remembered for. It's always difficult to define David Bowie's golden era because every era is different. I think if you speak to Bowie fans who got into him around the 71, 74 period, the spiders, Area, if you want, they'll always say that was the best period. And that was a period, and I particularly loved what he did because it was something that related more to rock. 
To say it's his golden era is unfair because Heroes and Low, a little later on, was a golden era as well. Station to Station was a golden era. He's done so many great albums in so many different styles over the years that all one can say is the 71 to 74 period was a golden era for David Bowie and very few artists actually can match what he achieved in those three years. I can't say I would change anything. Maybe the ending, but the rest of it was just... It was superb, you know. It's part of my career. It's, it's the highlight of my career, in a way. You know, I mean, Ziggy's a brilliant album. That it's not my favourite album, but it's a great album. That was, uh, I think, it was voted best album of all time for like fifteen years in Billboard, and, that. and I played on it. From playing in holding pubs and clubs to doing that, uh, it's tremendous. You know, there's not many people get that chance. I've got lots of friends who were the same age as me that never got that chance. So, I mean, I, I hold it right up there that, that period of time. I think it was superb. I did everything I thought that rock and roll was and it was. <laughs> you know?